Hi, welcome back to Projects with Everyday Dave. A few weeks ago, we had an ice storm and it knocked out the power for four and a half hours. Even though I have a 10 kilowatt solar array, it's grid tie with no battery backup. So when the power goes out, all of my power goes out. I had to drag out my gas power generator, put gas in it, make sure it was all oiled up and ready to go, run the wires and cables, fire it up, get everything running. And then a few hours later, I had to drain the gas out, put all the cables away and get it all put back away. It was kind of a pain in the butt. Fortunately, technology has been changing rapidly in the area of home battery backup, and it's time to ditch these alkaline batteries and look at what's new. I'm starting with the Blue Eddy EB70S, 800 watt portable power station. I wanted something that had a reasonable price point, but could still be used for some general home backup for short periods of time, as well as camping, traveling, and worksite support. If you've watched my other videos, you know I like actual data, so we're not just going to look at product specs. I'm going to do some actual testing, and I'm guessing you're going to be just as surprised as I was at some of these results. Product labels don't always tell you everything you need to know. I tested that full-size refrigerator, a home office setup, and a host of other appliances and tools. For efficiency's sake, I put in chapter markers so you can jump right to whatever topic interests you the most. At the end, I'll drop some conclusions to help you make the best decision for you. And I'll show you how you can get a discount on your own portable power station. So let's get started with the biggest appliance, the full-size refrigerator. The inverter in this unit is only 800 watts, so I didn't really expect my 1400 watt refrigerator to be able to run on it. And when I plugged it in, it buzzed for a second, clearly running past its 800 watt max, but it settled out at about 550 watts as it started up, and then most of the runtime was only about 200 watts. It ran for four and a half hours with regular use, opening and closing the doors before the battery died. So pretty amazing result, full-size refrigerator on this little unit for four and a half hours. Okay, I have plenty of fully or mostly discharged batteries here, and I have two chargers. So we'll see if the battery can handle charging all of these, how long it can charge for. So let's get started. So I'll just plug in both chargers, and then we'll put in one battery at a time. It's drawing next to nothing there. Everything's powered up. So we'll put in this uh, two amp hour battery. Immediately it's kicking up to 23 watts, and it's charging. No problem there, I'll add another one to this charger. It's done sensing, bumps it up to about 130 watts, a little over 130 watts, totally within the range of this unit. In fact, the fan hasn't even come on. So I'll track how many kilowatt hours we consume and we'll charge a whole bunch of batteries and get some idea of how long this would last on a job site. So this is pulling less than 150 watts. So the really cool thing about this is I could run both of these battery chargers all day long at a job site if I had the 200 watt Blue Eddy solar panels to go with it because with my analysis these panels can provide 150 watts no problem on a mostly sunny day basically all day long. So in that case with solar panels even if your battery was completely dead the solar charge controller would be able to supply the needed power to charge batteries all day long. That's a really neat additional feature, and one of the reasons that these units are so useful, they have a built-in solar charger along with the inverter. Well, that was absolutely no problem. We used less than 50% of the battery and charged seven high-capacity lithium-ion batteries. Obviously, it would be no problem for this thing to support a job site. It used 280 watt-hours of the battery, so there's still plenty of battery left. And of course, if you had the solar panels connected, you could just run it all day long. Really impressive result. This is a nice, lightweight, compact unit that would be a great asset to any job site. All right, this is a 1700 watt air fryer, so it shouldn't work, but I'm gonna try some low settings. Maybe we can get it to work a little bit. All right, that's the lowest setting. Let's see if it'll work. Nope. No go in the air fryer. If you're on a trip, camping, or just experiencing a power outage, who wouldn't want a nice hot loaf of bread? Now, my bread machine is 680 watts, so that comes under the 800 watt capacity of the battery, but it takes more than three hours to make a loaf of bread. So the question is, will the battery last long enough to bake the entire loaf of bread? The kneading process drew 20 to 70 watts for 30 minutes at a time. And then the rising and baking process took 450 to 500 watts at uh, periodic intervals to keep it warm. All right, bread's done. Let's see how it turned out. Apparently I put a little too much yeast in it. <laughs> <laughs> A 
Looks like the battery can make bread. Surprisingly, it only took 280 watt hours to make this loaf of bread, leaving more than 40% of the battery left over. Of course, you could never run an oven to cook a loaf of bread with this battery, but these smaller appliances are way more efficient. And who doesn't want a nice hot piece of bread? As soon as it came out, everybody came running to get a piece. All right, let's tackle the next one. Okay, we're gonna see if we can use the hot plate. I'm gonna try and do it on the lowest setting because it's a 1500 watt hot plate, so technically it shouldn't work. Powered up. Oh, turn it on. Okay. Fan came on. <laughs> Overload. Guess that's not gonna work. Shuts down immediately. Let's try the next one. All right, can it toast? 1800 watt toaster. We'll try just one side on bagel mode as low as it'll go. Hey, it's working. Bagel mode only uses the element on one side of the toast, cutting the power effectively in half. Ooh, 800 watts, wow. Turning off the bagel mode runs all four elements on one side of the toaster. It is maxing it out. Let's put a piece of toast in, see if it'll do it. All right, my bread's a little bit tall. Let's see if we can get it. Eight hundred and twenty-two watts. We are pushing this thing to its very limit. It's only supposed to put out eight hundred watts. And we're a little over that. Eight hundred and fifteen watts. Let's see how long it can hold. One hundred and twenty-seven watts there. I'm surprised it's not hitting the overload. It's only supposed to be able to do 800 watts and we're pushing it over that for a pretty extended period of time. Hey, popped up. And our bread is lightly toasted. Wow. Of course, if I try and push down too, we know what'll happen. 820 watts and <laughs> overload. But we can do one side. All right, we have a 1400 watt Vitamix. Let's see if we can blend something. Got some frozen fruit. Start on a low setting. Short. Hmm. That's interesting. Looks like we got our smoothie. Not bad. It's actually pretty good. Want some? All right, let's try the Keurig. See if we can brew some coffee. This is 1700 watts, so it's probably not gonna work. Let's turn it on and heat it up. Immediate overload. Overload. Won't even try. No coffee for you. All right, the Instapot is a thousand watts, so probably not gonna be able to get it to work, but we'll give it a shot. Let's try rice. Overload. 
I guess we're not using the Instant Pot. Okay, we have a 650 watt rice cooker here, which should work, but let's try it out. Looks like we're at 556 watts and no problems. So let's see if we can cook a whole pot of rice and see how much power that draws. And it worked, a full pot of rice, and it only used 150 watt hours, which is less than 23% of the battery. We could do four pots of rice, no problem with one charge. All right, let's check out the off-grid office setup. So if I plug in just the laptop to our power supply, it draws about 11 watts. And at that rate, it will literally last for more than two days without any solar input. I run my office with a side monitor, so we'll go ahead and plug that in. Plugging in the monitor gives us a combined load of about 48 watts, just under 50 watts. So together, those will still run a very long time. But maybe I wanna charge my phone. This has a nice convenient charger right on top. That should add about 15 watts to turn it on. We need to turn on the DC side. And now that's charging and that added five, six more watts. So now we're a little over 50 watts with the combined loads of all these, but maybe I wanna charge my drone while I'm at it. So I can plug in my drone battery pack to one of the USB-Cs and now it's starting to charge. Now we're up over 70 watts, which is still no problem for this unit. In fact, it's such a low load that the fan hasn't even come on. So I could sit here, I could charge my phone, I could charge a battery bank, I can run an external monitor, my laptop, and still be under 100 watts on this unit. And under 100 watts will run at least six hours. In order to prove out running my office system totally off-grid, I put the solar panels out the window. And I ran them on a partly cloudy, partly sunny day all day long. And it was such a low load that it wouldn't even drain the battery. So I plugged the refrigerator into it as well, pulling between 100 and 200 watts all day long. I was able to run my computer system for my office and my refrigerator in a power out situation with the solar panels all day long and still have most of the battery left over at the end of the day. For a home office situation, if you wanna to go to the beach and do your office or go camping and do your office or, or just be able to run it in a power outage situation, this will have no problem doing it. And if you have the solar panels, you could basically do it indefinitely. Let's talk about some of the specs. The Blue Eddy EB70S has the extra high power 800 watt inverter. Now we saw that it can actually do a little bit more than that. With the toaster, we were able to get 815 plus watts continually out of it, which was really fantastic. There were a few times where I was pulling high loads and the voltage dropped below 110 volts. Although with the toaster at 115 watts, it was still holding up above 110 volts. So I'm not sure exactly why that was. And on the DC side, I was able to pull 125 watts out of the DC 12 volt regulated outputs. The regular USB and USB-C ports were able to power multiple devices with no problem in addition to the wireless charge port on top. This unit has a 716 watt hour lithium iron phosphate battery, which is the perfect chemistry for this application. It has a 2500 cycle lifespan. That's a full charge discharge every day for nearly seven years. Before I did any of my capacity testing, I did a full charge discharge pretty much every day for three weeks. And I used my solar panels for most of the charging. I did an AC and a DC capacity test on this unit. Off the DC port, I pulled 65 watts for over 10 hours, giving me 654 watt hours of capacity, which is 91% of the rated capacity, which is really great performance. The AC slide was still really good, just slightly less. I was able to get 613 watt hours or about 86% of the rated capacity. Although this unit only has one charging port, it has multiple ways to charge. The first way is using the 12 volt charging port on your automobile. Unfortunately, this cord is very short and this unit is very heavy. So if you wanted to put it in the trunk or secure it somewhere in the car and then run a cord to it, you would need some kind of extension. However, it doesn't charge very quickly in the car. The documentation says it takes 7.8 to 8.3 hours to charge by this port. However, when I first plugged it in, my vehicle would deliver 100 watts. And then as soon as I started driving, it would drop down to 30 or 40 watts. At 30 or 40 watts, it would take 14 hours to charge this. Now, that's not because the battery can't take the power in. My vehicle is restraining the output. 
But as you've already seen, you can power multiple electronic devices from this unit for multiple days. So if you wanted to plug it in in the vehicle just to have a little bit of extra power coming in for supplement, that would be great. The second and fastest way to charge it is using the AC adapter. The AC adapter can provide 195 watts consistently with charges very quickly. All of my testing with the AC adapter charged in about 4 hours and 20 minutes. The manual claims a charge time of 4.1 to 4.6 hours so it falls right in that space. The most practical way to charge if you're trying to be off grid is using the solar connector. This is a reasonably long cord and when connected to the cord on the solar panel you can go quite a distance. I went from inside my house through the window and out into the yard. It has MC4 connectors on one end so you can connect other panels if you want to as long as they're under the rated input voltage of 28 volts. Now this 200 watt panel is matched for this unit so it gets the most out of the port that's available. Although it's a little bit pricey it is a really nice package. It's fairly lightweight. You can take it and the battery and just put them in the back of your vehicle. You can put them in the storage closet to pull out an emergency. They're very convenient to just fold out in the yard, on a beach, at a campsite. If you wanted a more permanent install, you could get an aluminum and glass frame solar panel and mount it out in the yard and run a, a line into the building. I tracked the performance of this panel starting at 8 o'clock in the morning. And from this graph you can see at 8 a.m. I was getting about 35 watts of input into the unit. And then I plotted that throughout the day. It ramped up rather quickly until it hit a maximum of about 150 watts. And that day, the maximum solar irradiance based on my irradiance meter was a little over a thousand watts per square meter, which is exactly what panels are rated at. And it charges fairly fast that way. It took me about six hours to charge from completely empty to completely full. Other days, when it was windy or partly cloudy, and I couldn't stand the panels up or I didn't have time to move them to face the sun, I could just put them out on the ground and stake them in place, and it would charge sometimes even less time, depending on how much sun there was and what time of day I started it. However, I did test days where I was getting closer to 1,200 watts per square meter, and the panel was able to provide closer to 170 watts. So depending on the intensity of the sun, you can get closer to that 200 watt number. But for most people, I think you'll probably max out around 150 watts. Even at that 150 watts, it charges within six hours, no problem from zero all the way to full. Overall, this unit has a great combination of form factor, size, weight, performance, and cost. It's really hard to go wrong. You'll be able to use this for so many different applications. You'll really enjoy it. Right now it's on sale. And if you use the coupon code I've included, you can get an additional discount beyond the sale price. I've included links for this unit, the solar panels, as well as some of the appliances I talked about, and a lot of other helpful information, especially if you're interested in installing solar at your house. I have an 11 kilowatt solar array that's completely DIY, and I'm always doing new and interesting things with that. So stick around, check it out, and I'll see you next time.